Okay, so welcome to the A-Level Cookbook. Today we're going to be doing AQA A-Level Biology Paper 1 from June 2019, so let's get started. Describe how a non-competitive inhibitor can reduce the rate of an enzyme-controlled reaction. So as a reminder, enzymes form enzyme substrate complexes. So as a quick diagram here, here's your enzyme, it forms a sub you know, here's your substrate, forms an enzyme substrate complex. So a competitive inhibitor is where it competes for the active site and it's a similar shape to the active site and blocks it from the substrate. So let's say that's the substrate and this is the inhibitor. The inhibitor is blocking the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors work differently. They do not compete for the active site. They don't want the active site. What they do is they actually bond to a different part of the enzyme, something called an allosteric site. And what it does is it actually sh changes the shape of the enzyme like that. And it's no longer complementary to the substrate. So it kind of like stretches and skews it. So that's what we would describe here in this question. So we would say something like that. Usually in exams, you can say something like it attaches to a, um, says it attaches to the enzyme at a different region to the active site. And then it changes the shape of the active site, changes shape of the active site. But this doesn't tell the examiner what the consequence is and how it leads to the enzyme not working. So you need to say what the consequence of this is. So it's like saying, if you say to me, if I ask you, how does a car drive? And you say it's got four wheels and an engine. That doesn't really tell me how it drives. The four wheels and the engine, well, the engine actually drives the car and moves it and the engine allows it to move. So we've said the car part here, we've said, we've described what's going on but we haven't said how this causes a problem. So what happens is the active site shape changes, so it is no longer complementary. So less substrate binds and forms ES complexes, enzyme substrate complexes. So you need to say the consequence, right? So pectin is a substance found in some fruit and vegetables. A scientist investigated the effect of pectin on the hydrolysis of lipids by a lipase enzyme, and his results are shown in figure one. So please look at the diagram and actually interpret what's going on. Because the amount of people that just jump to the question and try and work backwards and say, oh, the question's asking this. Let me try and uh, see what the graph says. Never works. Just try looking at it and understanding it first. So we've got lipase activity, which describes the activity of the enzyme, how much work the enzyme is doing. And you can see with no pectin added, it increases and then it levels off at about like what, one-ish. And here, the pectin has been added, it increases but levels out way below at a much lower level. So now let's get onto the question. So the scientist concluded that pectin is a non-competitive inhibitor of the lipase enzyme. Use figure one to explain why they concluded this. I forgot to mention before, sorry, as well, this is increasing lipid concentration. So if you're increasing the lipid, you've got loads and loads of enzyme substrate complexes forming until you can't have any more forming because there's not enough enzymes. So imagine, imagine I've got three enzymes here, right? One, two, three. And I've got one, I've got one lipid here, you know, one lipid molecule. That's, that's, you know, obviously I can add more and the reaction can continue and go faster. But there comes a point where I've added so much lipid, there isn't enough enzyme to go around, so there's not enough active sites to form enzyme substrate complexes. So that's what's happening here with this leveling off part, is that there's so much lipid and there's not enough enzyme. The problem here is that with pectin, so they're adding pectin and it's inhibiting. So surely, if they've added pectin and it was a competitive inhibitor, that it would just block some active sites, but if you had enough lipid, the effects would just cancel out. There's so much lipid, the chance of an enzyme running into this competitive inhibitor is pretty low. So the, uh, the overall rate doesn't get limited too much and it just keeps getting back up again, it'll level up. However, it levels up and stops. So what's happened is that this is probably not a competitive inhibitor and actually a non-competitive inhibitor because it binds here and it changes the active site shape, like so. So if it changes the active site shape, let's say these are more triangle now than circular, it doesn't matter how much lipid you've got here, they can't actually bind because they're not complementary. So that's how you can deduce that. So now obviously we need to write this in terms of exam terminology. So it says use figure one to explain why they concluded this. Despite adding loads and loads of lipid, it doesn't overcome the fact that the inhibitor is there. So increased lipid does not overcome inhibition. You could also say something like high substrate doesn't meet, reach the max because the max activity that we can see here is about one, but it's nowhere near one. Or you could say something like increasing the substrate doesn't actually increase the rate of reaction, but I would probably go with this. That's the most strong evidence. The scientist also found that pectin stops the action of bile salts and it produced two suspensions. Suspension A, which is lipid and bile salts, and suspension B, which is lipid, bile salts, and pectin. He did not add lipase to either of them. He observed samples from the suspensions using an optical microscope, and figure two shows what he saw in a typical sample. 
So it says calculate the maximum length of the large lipid droplet marked X in figure two. Using a ruler with millimeter intervals always includes an uncertainty in the measurement. Use the uncertainty in your measurement to determine the uncertainty of your calculated maximum length. Okay, fine. So the maximum length, what you would do is you'd get your ruler and you'd measure it like this. And then you can use this formula here, which is I equals M, I am, where image equals your actual size times magnification. Now, when, when measuring this, you need to make sure that you have the units the same or it doesn't work. So obviously, the question wants us to work out the actual size. So you would do the actual equals your image. So what you measured in millimeters or whatever unit it is over the magnification. And you need to make sure that this, this will give you the actual size in millimeters. The question wants it in micrometers. So you would have to divide this by a thousand to get it into micrometers. Now, I don't have a ruler on hand to do this, and obviously this is scaled down because I'm working on a whiteboard digitally, so I can't really do this question. But if you do that technique, you should get the right answer. Now, it says using a ruler with millimeter intervals always includes an uncertainty. So a millimeter, so the uncertainty is plus or minus half of the smallest thing you've got going on. So with a millimeter, with your ruler, you've got your ruler here, whatever, blah, 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 and you're measuring whatever, right? you're assuming that this zero is zero and that one is one when this zero in theory could be like you know it could be 0 0.5 or it could be technically minus 0 0.5 like a little bit over to the side and this one could be 0 0.5 to one so you've got two uncertainties of 0 0.5 here so taking that one reading has an uncertainty of plus or minus one millimeter however you've taken two readings so this uncertainty doubles so the uncertainty in your measurement is plus or minus two millimeters but obviously we're working in micrometers so you would need to use your you would need to convert it using the magnification, dividing it by your magnification, blah blah blah, and changing its units, and it should get plus or minus two. Okay, so no large lipid droplets are visible with the optical microscope in the samples from suspension A. Explain why. So they've got suspension A here. We can't really see any massive lipid droplets. We need to think about why. So suspension A has lipids and bile salts. So if you remember, bile salts make lipids form smaller droplets. So what they do is you've got these big ass you know, lipid things, and they get broken, well, not broken down, but split up into tiny little droplets by bile salts. This process is called emulsification. And this increases the surface area for lipase to work on. That's the whole point of bile salts. So the first reason as to why we can't see massive droplets is because of emulsification by bile salt. Okay, so now it's obviously asking, why can't we see these as distinct things? You can see the sort of weird blurs and stuff, but you can't see distinct circles. The reason for that is because the resolution of this optical microscope is too small. So low resolution. Resolution, to summarize as a quick thing, is how well something can distinguish between two points close together. So a good resolution would, you being, would be being able to see these two circles as separate things. Whereas if I've got this here, if I zoom out really, 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 really far, it almost looks like one dot. That's a very poor resolution because you can't tell they're two separate dots. Table one shows cell wall components in plants, algae, fungi, and prokaryotes. Complete table one by putting a tick where the cell wall component is present. So plants have cellulose and algae have cellulose because algae are pretty much plants, a single cell. Murine is in prokaryotes and like bacteria and stuff, and chitin is in fungi. It's just one of them things, cells, mate. Cell walls make up much of the fiber people eat. Scientists investigated the risk between the mass of fiber people ate each day and their risk of cardiovascular disease. They gathered the data from a large sample of people and used this to calculate a relative risk. A relative risk of one means there's no difference between the risk of the sample and the whole population. A relative risk of less than one means it's less likely than in the whole population. And a relative risk of more than one means that cardiovascular disease is more likely to happen in the people in the sample than the whole population. So the results are as follows. So relative risk is on this axis. So if it's higher than one, you've got an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. If it's less than one, your risk is lower. And we can see we've got the mass of fiber consumed. And as the mass grow, as the mass of fiber increases, you can see there's a sort of downward trend. So the straight line is the mean relative risk, and the dotted line is a line of best fit showing plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean. Each plus plotted represents a thousand people. A student concluded from figure three that eating an extra 10 grams of fiber a day would significantly lower his risk of cardiovascular disease. Evaluate his conclusion. So whenever you get questions to do with evaluates, what I like to do is I always say for, against, and other factors. So the reasons for is obviously what stuff in the data suggests that he might be right. So there's a negative correlation between the two. You can see that as this data suggests that as you eat more fiber, it drops. So you could say that, that there is a negative correlation. That's 
that's something for what he said, okay? What other things are there we could say? I mean, there's not really much else that supports his sort of data. Now we need to criticize what's going on here. So obviously the first thing is correlation doesn't always mean causation. Correlation doesn't equal causation. An example I like to use is imagine if I had 10 people in a room and I gave them chocolate and these people all happen to be six foot and every single one of them that ate the chocolate got unbelievable, horrible, uncontrolled diarrhea. I can't just go and then say, okay, well, every tall person on the planet who eats chocolate is going to shit themselves because that doesn't happen in real life. That obviously means that correlation doesn't equal causation. There's probably other factors in play as well. So there's that. What else can we talk about? Well, an in increasing, so eating an extra 10 grams of fiber. So if I look, so if we look at like 30 to 40, for example, versus 10 to 20, the drop in risk is about what, like, you know, the drop in risk is as high as 1.25 down to one. Whereas the drop from like 20, sorry, 20 to 30 is a lot less. So obviously we need to know the original amounts of fiber eaten so we can make a comparison. So we don't even know how much fiber this guy has. So original fiber intake, not known. Okay, and this person's saying that just eating fiber would lower his risk of cardiovascular disease. We know that cardiovascular disease can be due to smoking, obesity, it can be due to, you know, um, in, in high saturated fats in diets, loads of different things. So there's other factors involved. However, this is the same mark as this. So sadly, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same mark in this one. What else can we say? Well, there's no statistical test to show that these differences are significant. So what that means is if I flip a coin 10 times, you would expect five out of 10 to be heads. But in reality, I could get all 10 to be heads or none of them at all. And that is luck. That's chance. These results, we don't know if these results are due to chance. We don't know if by chance or in a, in a weird way, luckily this happened. We don't know if this would happen all the time or if it was just in this one time. And that's what statistical tests do, is that they show whether these results actually happened as a result of something or whether it was just luck or chance. So you can talk about that as well. And as well as that, a two times standard deviation is pretty wide as well. Like if you can see the spread of these results is pretty wide. If there was, if these, if this was a straight line and the standard deviations followed it very closely, that would look much better and be more reliable than something that's spreading out like this. Cause that's implying that, you know, the relative risk of somebody who's had 60 is all the way up here and down here as well as being there. So those are some points you can talk about. So with evaluate questions, always talk about for or against and other things. Other things you could talk about are sample sizes, the patient age, sex, gender, ethnicity, you know, was it done in uh, was it done in an actual body of a human being or was it done in a test tube? There's loads of different things you can talk about. But in this circumstance, these are the factors I'd discuss. Okay, the scientist estimated the mean mass of fiber eaten each day using a food frequency questionnaire. The FFQ asks each person how often they've eaten many types of food over the past year. An alternative method to calculate the fiber eaten is for a nurse to ask each person detailed questions about what they've eaten in the last 24 hours. What's one advantage of using the FFQ method and one disadvantage of using the FFQ method with the alternative method? So the FFQ asks what different types of food they've eaten over the past year rather than the alternative method which is the last 24 hours. So the advantage of using the FFQ is that, you know, it's over a long time period. But that's not the mark. You need to say why that is. So why is that good? Well, it's representative. So, you know, it's more representative, sorry. What this means, it's more reliable describing what they probably eat. Because if I go out for a nice takeaway last night and you ask me what I ate in the last 24 hours, you're working on the assumption that I eat a takeaway every single day, which is not true and it's not representative. So that's what you need to talk about. With these kinds of questions, you need to say what the advantage is and why. A lot of people will just say it's over a long time period and not say why, because that means absolutely nothing. Because if it's an over a long time period, you're not selling whether it, it might be that I, I could have lied that entire time. I could have eaten utter rubbish that entire time. You need to explain why it's good. Other things you could talk about, you could talk about cost effectiveness as well. So you can obviously, it's a questionnaire versus hiring somebody to do this. And also people are more likely to be honest on writing in a questionnaire as well, rather than, you know, answering somebody, confronting them effectively saying, mate, like, what are you eating, bud? Disadvantages. Do you remember what you've eaten in the whole year, bro? Because I don't. I do not remember what I ate on like, you know, January 1st uh, at 8 p.m. So obviously it relies on long term memory, so that might not be that accurate. Whereas remembering over the last 24 hours might be more accurate. So I would say something like that. So it would say like um, relies on remembering food over last year. OK, so a group of students investigated biodiversity of different areas of farmland. They collected data in each of these habitats. So they got the center of a field, the edge of a field, and a hedge between the fields. And there's, here's their figures. So the index of diversity is a way of measuring biodiversity. 
where it talks about the number of species and the number of each species and takes them into effect, it takes them into account. So the higher the number, the higher the index of diversity, the more diverse an area is. If all the individuals of the same species, so they're all like, you know, one specific type of parrot or something, then the, the index is one. It's not very diverse. If you look at the center of a field, the index of diversity is 0 0.8, is 0 0.8 something. Here it's 0 0.92, here it's 0 0.96. So it's implying that the hedge between the fields has the highest biodiversity. So what data would the students need to collect to calculate the index of diversity in each habitat? Do not talk about the apparatus used. So to work out the index of diversity, it's D equals big N, N minus one over sigma N, N minus one, little N minus one, where big N is the total number of organisms of all species over little N, which is the total number of organisms of one species. So these are the two things that they would need, the data. They're asking you what data they would need, not how do they measure this, it's what data. And they even in the clarified view not to talk about sampling or the apparatus used. Okay, give two ways that the students can ensure their index of diversity was representative of each habitat. Well, first of all, biggest one is random samples. If you choose an area that looks cooler to you, that's automatically put bias in your results. And also you wanna do a large number of samples as well. Or what you could also do is continue sampling until you get a stable running mean. So running mean is where you keep working at the mean after each point and eventually you can see it'll start to level out like this. And that's kind of when you know when you've got enough samples. Modern farming techniques have led to larger fields and the removal of hedges between fields. Use figure four to suggest why biodiversity decreases when farmers use larger fields. So they're removing the hedges between fields. So if you're removing hedges between fields, well, you can see that they've got a massive index of diversity here. So that means you've got more center and less edge. So you, you've, got, you've got more center and less edge, obviously, because you can't have hedges between the fields. You've obviously got to remove that too. So you've got more center and less edge. So fewer species, because if you look, you, you know, your index of diversity is massive here and you've just obliterated this and you probably obliterate that. So there's more of this here. Farmers are now being encouraged to replant hedges on their land, suggest so one advantage and one disadvantage for replanting. The obvious advantage is that there's more biodiversity, but that doesn't really mean anything. We need to explain why that's good. If a farmer wants to make loads and loads of wheat, why on earth would a farmer want to add like all of these other different types of plants, which would take nutrients from the soil and obviously use up the stuff that the wheat could obviously take? So we need to talk about why that's a pro why increased biodiversity is a good thing. So you could talk about increased biodiversity, meaning that there's more predators for pests. Because if you think about it, like if there's something eating wheat, something that eats the wheat is also going to be predated on by something else because food chains, you know. So that there's going to be more of that predator eating the thing that eats your wheat. So that's a good thing. So there's more biodiversity. So there's more predators of pests. So that's a good thing. You could also talk about more pollinators as well. So for example, there's more flowers that carry, sorry, there's more bees and stuff that carry pollen. So there's more wheat as well. The mark scheme also says you could talk about attracting more tourists, but I think that's a bit of a weird one to say for farmers. Right, disadvantages then. Increased biodiversity means that there's more pests, which means less, you know, useful stuff. Also, as well as that, it's more difficult to farm. They have to spend more money farming all of this stuff rather than just one thing. So there's less income too. And you could also talk about interspecific competition as well. So like the wheat might be competing with some other plant or something for nutrients from the soil. So those are other things you can talk about. Scientists collected data on 800,000 human births. The data showed the mass of each baby at birth or whether the baby needed to be transferred to a special care unit for very ill baby. So here, here's what we have. We have population frequency here. We've got the mass at birth. And you can see that the mass of birth here is in the straight line and the dotted line is transferred to special unit. So the special units are very high at this lower extreme and then it drops towards the middle and it climbs up again at the extreme. So very babies with a very low birth weight and a very high birth weight tend to go to the special care unit, whereas ones towards the middle don't. This is called stabilizing selection. So this is an example of that. So now it says, use figure five to explain how human birth mass could be affected by stabilizing selection. Well, I've just told you that right now. So you can see that, so obviously we've got to use the figures. We need to state some data. So if we look at around uh, let's see, like what, 2,800-ish. So around 2,800-ish, you're more likely to be in a specialist care. You know, babies less than 2,800 grams, increased likelihood of specialist care unit. And then obviously the same goes for babies that are over, what, like 4,200-ish maybe? So same for babies. Obviously you'd write it like a bit better than this, but yeah, over 4,200 grams. Babies in the middle have least 
transfers to, you know, the um, specialist care unit. Therefore, babies at each extreme less likely to survive and, and pass on their alleles. You need to talk about that for extreme mass. Therefore, the middle is favored. So with these kinds of questions, when they're talking about selection, stabilizing selection, directional selection, disruptive selection, whatever, right? You need to talk about the phenotype of the baby. So for example, here, they have a low birth weight and a high birth weight. You need to talk about the implications of that. And obviously why they, you know, the extremes aren't favored here, but the middle is. But then it's talking about selection. So selection talks about the sort of long-term effects of it. So you need to talk about the survival, the, the ability to reproduce eventually when they hit reproductive ages and passing on their alleles. Because what stabilizing selection means is that the individuals in the middle are favored and they are more likely to survive and reproduce, blah, 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 and so on. So talking about just the fact that these smaller babies and larger babies won't survive doesn't, isn't enough. It doesn't show that there's selection going on. There is, a, there is a driving force changing the proportion. Because what this is trying to get at is that babies with a lower mass and a baby with a higher mass are less likely to survive and reproduce. So over time, most babies will have alleles that make them have a, you know, a middle mass at birth rather than these extremes. That's what selection is talking about. In the same way, if we had something like directional selection, so for example, if we lived in a very cold climate and we had a graph like this where there's lots of fur and little fur, the individuals with little fur are going to, you know, obviously not survive, not reproduce, and so on. But the individuals with lots of fur are. Eventually what's going to happen is the, the number of individuals with little fur is going to drop and the number of individuals with lots of fur are going to increase because the ones with lots of fur are more likely to survive, reproduce, pass on the alleles that's, that encode for lots of fur. That's what selection's talking about the end goal, the end effect. So the scientists studied the effect of one form, KIR2DS1, KIR of the human KIR gene on the mass of births. It says, write the correct biological term beside each number below that matches the space in the passage. So KIR2DS1 so KIR is a something. So this is, an, this is a form of a gene. So a different form of a gene is known as an allele. of the KIR gene found at a something on chromosome 19. So it's a location, a place, an area that's known as a locus. KIR2DS1 is a 14,021 bases long, sorry, it's, it is that long, and is something into mRNA. So if we're going from DNA to mRNA, that is transcription. We are transcribing something, we are changing it, we are rewriting it in a different form. Uh, that is 1,000, sorry, 1,101 bases long. This mRNA is then something into a polypeptide, so you're making a protein out of it. So that's translation. That is 304 amino acids long. The polypeptide is then modified in the organelle before forming its functional something structure. So we need to, so we need to talk about the organelle that processes and folds proteins and stuff, which is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You write the full thing. I'm just writing RAR because I'm lazy. You could also talk about Golgi apparatus as well. And then the final functional form of a protein is its tertiary structure. It does not say 3D. 3D means nothing. You need to say tertiary structure. Part of the tertiary structure is the 3D shape. As well as that, it's the bonds that form. It's the hydrogen and ionic bonds and all of that kind of stuff. So you can't just say 3D on its own. You've got to say tertiary. It says ignore 3D in this context. Okay, the scientists studied 1,500 more births. They recorded the mass of birth of each baby and the nature of the KIR gene in the mother's genome. So we've got the presence, whether the gene is at, the allele is there or not, and then the number of babies with mass at birth between 2,500 and 4,500 and above. Okay, so it says the scientists use a statistical test to test the following null hypothesis. The presence of this, this allele in the mother's genome does not affect the frequency of births above 4,500 grams. Tick one box that gives the name of the statistical test that the scientists should use to test this null hypothesis. So what they're saying is that they are comparing an expected and an observed result. So in this null hypothesis, they're, ex they're expecting that this has no effect on the number of babies in each of these, and they should be the same between each category. When you're testing expected and observed results, so they observe these results in real life, when you're comparing those two, it is the chi-squared test, which would be this. The correlation coefficient is where you're looking at a correlation between two quantities, and the student t-test is when you're comparing differences in the means of two things. So if I have the mean number of babies of this and the mean number of that, and I'm comparing if there's a difference between the two of them, that's when I do the t-test. But here we are comparing an expected and an observed result. So that's chi-squared. Okay, so the scientists calculated a p-value in testing their null hypothesis. What can you say about that? So this is, what, this is a question that every single person on the planet 
seemingly just puts a manufactured answer out and gets it wrong. Look at the null hypothesis and what they're saying. So they're saying the presence of this gene does not affect the frequency of the births above 4,500 grams. We got a p-value that's less than 0.05. I'm just going to quickly explain this concept. When we use p-values, it's to make sure that whatever we're testing is not due to chance, it's not luck. And it just happens that we decided to use 0.05 or 5% as our threshold. Okay, so let's say I flip a coin and, you, and I do it 10 times. You would expect that it would be a heads 5 out of 10 times, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes, you know, I get 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I could get any of them. And that is chance, that is luck. We do statistical tests to make sure that the results are not due to luck or chance, okay? So these scientists have tested whether the, there is a difference in the frequency of births above 4,500 grams. They've said, okay, we've got some differences here. You can see that it's, you know, 148 versus 173. Is this just chance? Is this just luck? I don't want to say the word luck, but you can kind of interchange the two. Is it just chance or is there something actually going on? If the p-value is higher than 0.05, they can say, okay, it was probably just luck, it was probably just chance, we need to keep testing to see. If it's less than 0.05, there is probably a, there's, you know, it's probably not luck and something's actually going on. So what this means is, what we can conclude is, is that the probability of the results, we need to say what the actual results are, you can't just say the results, of the difference in frequency of babies above 4,500 grams. So the probability of the difference being luck or due to chance, you shouldn't say luck in an exam, you say due to chance, I'm just using luck to simplify it, is less than 0.05. Okay, so the probability of these differences here being due to chance is less than 0.05. What that means is we can reject the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis says is that there's no difference between the two of them. But we've just tested it and we can see there's a difference here, it's 173 versus 148. But we've also tested it and prob tested its probability of it being due to luck, and we've said it's not due to luck. So therefore, this null hypothesis doesn't apply, and that there is a difference between the two of them. And then we need to conclude what we actually... We need to talk about what we can conclude now. We can't just drop it here, we need to say what this actually means. This means that the presence of KIR to DS1, or whatever the allele is, does affect the frequency of high birth mass, or births above 400,000, sorry, or births above 4,500 grams. It's really important you get your terminology right in this stuff. So again, just to summarize, they are testing whether this difference we see here, the 148 and the 173, is luck. Because their null hypothesis says they should be the same, so should, they should both really be 448. But they've tested it, and they see there's a difference, so now they want to see, is this test luck, or did it actually happen? They've tested the probability, and the probability is 0.03. So the probability of these results being due to luck, or being due to chance, is less than 0.05. That's this whole first point here. The results are the difference between these two. You can't just say the results, you need to clarify what that is. Therefore, we can reject the null hypothesis, because their null hypothesis was that these two would be the same. But it's not. Then we need to say what we can conclude. They said that this does not change the amounts between the two, the frequencies. These sh it, it says that this KIR to DS1 means that they're both going to be the same, but it's not. So therefore, KIR to DS1 does affect the frequency of births. Okay, so now it says describe the structure of the human immun immunodeficiency HIV. So this is something you guys just need to, this is something that you guys do need to learn about. So you've got RNA, you've got a capsid, and around the capsid you have the envelope. And on the envelope, so within the envelope, you've got these attachment proteins here like this. As well as that, you've also got reverse transcriptase. So saying all of those is enough. One of the marks is by saying there's RNA here. Another one is saying reverse transcriptase. And then here you've got attachment proteins. And you've got your envelope. And you've got your capsid. Those are all marks. So saying all of that gives you them marks. And it says accept a labeled diagram too. So you could just do that. But obviously labeling it. Some people infected with HIV do not develop AIDS. These people are called... HIV controllers. Scientists measured the number of HIV particles, the viral load, and the number of one type of helper cell, T helper cell called CD4 cells, in the blood of a group of HIV controllers and also those with HIV positive that were positive who had symptoms of AIDS. The median value and the ranges of their results are shown as be uh, below. The HIV, so we've got HIV controllers and HIV positive people with AIDS symptoms. So the mean viral load is 212. It's ranging from 50 to 609. Whereas the mean viral load in people who are HIV positive with AIDS symptoms is 66,000, so it's massive. And their ranges don't overlap, so these are pretty different. 
The median number of CD4 cells in HIV controls is 693, and it ranges from 529 to 887. Whereas in people with HIV pos- that are HIV positive with AIDS, it's 248, so it's a lot lower, and there's no range overlap either. So what we can kind of draw from this is that people with HIV that can control it have a lower viral load and, you know, good T cell numbers or CD4 cell numbers, whereas people that are HIV positive with AIDS symptoms have a massive viral load and a lot lower CD4 number cells. A test sample of 500 millimeters cubed of blood is taken from an HIV controller to determine the viral load. Take one box that shows the number of virus particles that would be present in a test sample of blood taken from an HIV controller with the median viral So the median viral load is 212, and that's particles per centimeter cubed. So we need to convert this to millimeters cubed first, obviously. So one centimeter is 10 millimeters. Therefore, one centimeter cubed is 10 cubed millimeters cubed. So one centimeter cubed equals 1,000 millimeters cubed. So now we have 212 particles per 1,000 millimeters cubed. They've taken a 500 millimeter cubed sample. So if we're going from 1,000 to 500, we've halved this. So this has to be halved as well, which gives you 106, which is there. Okay, so now it says, use the data in table three in your knowledge of the immune response to suggest why HIV controllers do not develop symptoms of AIDS. Well, HIV controllers, first of all, you can say is that they have more CD4 cells and they've got a lower viral load straight off the bat. But we can't just talk about viral load on it, so we need to talk about the implication of it. So HIV replicates inside helper T cells and leads to disease that way. So therefore, if they've got a lower viral load, there are lower, you know, numbers of infected T cell. Okay? So that's a good that's a good start. We need to talk about what the importance of T cells are. So CD4 cells in this context are T cells. So I'm going to quickly summarize the immune response here. So you've got your immune response starting with your phagocyte, scranning and engulfing and digesting, whatever, blah, 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 and you know, presenting the antigen here. So the phagocyte engulfs and digests the pathogen and a helper T cell comes along, binds to the antigen using a receptor and it sends out chemical signals. These chemical signals bind to complementary receptors on B cells, which undergo you know, clonal selection to form plasma cells and monoclonal antibodies like so, and it also binds to other phagocytes to enc- encourage them to engulf and digest and do more things, and it also also stimulates cytotoxic T-cells as well, okay? So cytotoxic T-cells, phagocytes, and B-cells. So if you've got HIV infecting these cells, the CD4 cells can't be activated, the helper T-cells can't be activated, so you've got fewer phagocytes activated, no cytotoxic T-cells being activated, and no B-cells being activated either, and that's what leads to disease. So that's what we need to talk about here. So if they have more CD4 cells and less infected T cells, that means you've got more B cells, you know, dividing to produce plasma cells, plasma cells, and monoclonal antibodies. I'm going to write MABs for short, but you write the whole thing. And that means that there are, you know, they're able to destroy other pathogens. So they don't actually get disease. They don't get the symptoms of AIDS. So that's how that works. Okay, so scientists investigate the cell cycle in heart cells taken from mice six days before their birth and then at 4, 14, and 21 days after their birth. The results are as follows. So at minus six days, 4, 14, and 21, so minus six I'm presuming is when they're still in, you know, the womb. So the percentage of heart cells undergoing mitosis is highest in the younger age and it starts to drop and the percentage of DNA replication is also dropping as well. So it says describe and explain the data in table four. So obviously you can see that the growth is slowing from, you know, birth to 21 days. Why? Because there's less mitosis. And what else can we talk about? So it says percentage of heart cells undergoing DNA replication also drops. But surely if you've got more heart cells, you would have more replication, right? Because there's more cells to do that and they need to do that before rep mitosis. Well, for this reason, it's probably that the percentage of DNA cells undergoing DNA replication is also dropping too. So that must imply that mitosis is slowing down or stopping. So what's probably happening is that the cells are losing the ability to divide because because DNA replication happens before mitosis. If there's less DNA replication happening, there's probably less mitosis happening. And we can see that there's less mitosis happening here. The scientists determine the percentage of heart cells undergoing DNA replication using a chemical called BRDU. Cells use BRDU instead of nucleotides containing thymine during DNA replication. Describe how BRDU would be incorporated into new DNA using semi-conservative replication. So what this is basically saying is that BRDU replaces thymines. You've got ATCG, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about DNA replication just in a quick summary because I see people write the wrong stuff all the time and it drives me insane. So DNA replication normally happens. So we've got our DNA strand here. 
chilling, whatever, right? And we've got our second one here. So these these pointy outy bits are your bases and they form complementary base pairs and hydrogen bonds, right? So you've got A and T, for example, here. So what happens is these hydrogen bonds between them are broken by DNA helicase. A so DNA helicase comes along and snips them in half. DNA helicase. It's called helicase because it breaks the helix. Helicase break enzyme. So now we've got two strands that act as templates. So what next happens is complementary base pairs that are just floating around line up next to their respective bases. So if you've got A here, a T will line up with it here and they form hydrogen bonds between each other. But it's still not DNA because they're just DNA, they're just bases floating next to each other. These bases have to actually be joined this way. So we've got complementary base pairing. They've made the hydrogen bonds, but they're not actually fixed in place. So that's where DNA polymerase comes along and joins them this way. So DNA polymerase joins adjacent nucleotides via condensation to form phosphodiester bonds. The problem that I see, the thing that I get wrong is that people keep saying that DNA polymerase either catalyzes complementary base pairing or it joins complementary bases, which is wrong. Complementary base pairing happens because they just line up like this. If you're saying DNA polymerase is joining complementary bases, you're saying that it's joining these two together. And that does not give you DNA. That gives you this, which is just not right and not wrong, not correct. It joins them this way, downwards like that, so you get two strands like so. So please, please, please do not say DNA polymerase joins complementary bases because you're saying they stick together like this, which is wrong. They join adjacent nucleotides next to each other to form a big complementary strand. Now that I've got that out of the way, let's actually talk about what happens in this question. So, so okay, so like I said, AT whatever lines up, right? But instead of T, now we've got BRDU instead. So BRDU lines up and forms a complementary base pair with A instead or adenine. There, then, as like I mentioned before, DNA polymerase joins these adjacent nucleotides together and then you get phosphodiester bonds. So I can guarantee you that the mark scheme says this. Every single time you talk about molecules joining, breaking, bonding, whatever, right? Always, always, always talk about condensation if bonds are being made and hydrolysis if bonds are being broken. And also what type of bonds are being made? Is it a phosphodiester bond for nucleotides? Is it a glycosidic bond for glucose? Is it an ester bond for lipids? Is And so on. Okay, so now in summary, what we can say is DNA helicase breaks hydrogen bonds between base pairs. BRDU binds to complementary base, which is adenine, and you need to clarify that. And DNA polymerase joins adjacent nucleotides by condensation. And last but not least, phosphodiester bonds cells with BRDU in their DNA are detected using an anti-BRDU antibody with an enzyme attached. Use your knowledge of the ELISA test to suggest and explain how scientists identify the cells that have BRDU in there. So you've got your antigen here. In this case, this is going to be our BRDU. We add an anti-BRDU antibody with an enzyme attached, and that will obviously combine. It will stay fixed in place. Then obviously you want to wash off all the other unbound antibody, like so. So that all gets washed off. Because if you don't wash it off and it stays there, and you add a substrate, it's going to give a color change. Because the next step is you add a substrate and you get a, and the substrate reacts with this enzyme and you get a color change. So the reason we wash off this stuff is because we don't want the color change to happen unless it's bonded to the BRDU. So that's what you would say. You would add anti-BRDU with an enzyme attached, and then you would wash to remove unbound antibody, and then you add a substrate, and then you get a color chain. <clears throat> Ova lactuca is an alga that lives on the rocks in this on the seashore. It's regularly covered by seawater, and here's a diagram of it. So you've got a thallus, the green light leaf part, and you've got the hold vast which attaches to the rock. Unlike plants, Ova lactuca does not have any xylem tissue. Suggest how it's able to survive without it. Okay, so it says that it's generally covered by seawater. So this thing's surrounded by it. It probably doesn't need xylem because it's not really trying to, you know, get water up from the roots and stuff. It's surrounded by it. So it's probably really thin and has a short diffusion pathway. Or it might be that it's got loads and loads and loads and loads of little holes and water can enter. So it's either got a short diffusion pathway or it's, perme it's got a surface that's permeable to water. So short diffusion pathway. So Uva lactuca has a haploid and a diploid form and it shows the life cycle. So you've got all of this stuff here. You've got the diploid alga, haploid mobile single cell, haploid alga, two haploids making a diploid zygote and so on. 
On figure 7, complete each box with an appropriate letter to show the type of cell division happening. Use T to represent mitosis and E to make meiosis. So you're going from diploid to haploid, so that has to be meiosis, because you're making gametes that are haploid. So the next step is you're going from a haploid to a haploid, but it's a bigger thing. So it's this single cell now becoming a whole alga, so this has to be T as well. Because if it was, if it was, my, if it was meiosis, which is E, that would half again, but that's not halved. It's still haploid here, so it still has to be T, because, you know, they're breaking off whatever it might be that they're doing, but it's still a T. These two haploids combine to make a diploid, and then this diploid becomes another diploid and splits. So it's a diploid zygote becoming the whole alga, so it has to be mitosis, because you're still keeping the chromosome number the same. Ova prolifera also produces haploid mobile single cells that can fuse to form a zygote. Suggest and explain one reason why successful reproduction between ova prolifera and ova lactuca does, does not happen. Okay, well, you can see that this is ova prolifera, so the genus is ova, and that's still genus, same, same genus ova, but this is prolifera, and that's lactuca, so they are different species. And one of the things about species is that they cannot interbreed to produce fertile offspring. If they're different, that is, fertile offspring. So if you have, if you have the same species, they can breed to produce fertile offspring, Whereas if they are different species, they cannot produce fertile offspring. Oh my god, the water potential of leaves is affected by the water content of the soil. Scientists grew sunflower plants. They supplied different plant plants with different volumes of water. After two days, they determined the water potential in the leaf cells by using an instrument that gave a voltage reading. They generated a calibration curve to convert the voltage reading to water potential, and here's the calibration curve. So you've got voltage here, and you've got water potential here. Okay. The scientists needed solutions of known water potentials to generate their calibration curve. The table shows how to make a sodium chloride solution with a water potential of minus 1.95 MPa. Complete table 5 by giving all the headings, units, and volumes required to make 20 centimeters cubed of this sodium chloride solution. The volume of 1 mole per decimeter cubed sodium chloride solution, what's in centimeters cubed to this part? I mean, you think about what goes on here. So we're obviously diluting it to make the concentration what we want, so it has to be volume of water, which is in centimeters cubed. So think of it this way, the concentration we have to start with C1 is 1 mole per decimeter cubed. V1, we don't know. This is the volume of this stuff that we want to mix with whatever. C2 is the desired concentration of 0 0.04, and the volume we want is V2, which is 20 centimeters cubed. Oh, and this is per decimeter cubed, sorry. So therefore, C1 V1 has to equal C2 V2 because they're the same amount of, on well, the same proportion of sodium chloride in either, either of them. So V1 equals 0 0.04 times 20 over a thousand because we need to convert it to decimeters cubed. So V1 equals 0 0.0008 times the decimeters cubed. Okay, now we need to convert this into centimeters cubed, which is that times a thousand, which is 0 0.8 centimeters cubed. So from the original solution, we want 0 0.8 centimeters cubed of this stuff. We want to make it up to 20 centimeters cubed. All you need to do is just add 19.2. That's how you do it. So C1 is the concentration that you've been given. V1 is how much of that you need to take out to make your solution. C2 is the concentration you want, which is 0 0.04 in this case. And the volume is the amount of the total volume you want. So whatever this V1 is, you need to add the rest. You need to add water to make it up to this. So our V1 worked out to be 0 0.8. So you're taking 0 0.8 of this stuff, and then you're adding 19.2 of water to make it the volume we want. Table 6 shows the concentrations of sodium chloride the scientists used on the water potential of each solution. So table 6, you've got concentration here, it's going up, and the water potential is becoming more negative. There's a linear relationship between the water potential and the concentration of the sodium chloride solution. Use the data in table 6 to calculate the concentration of sodium chloride solution with a water potential of this. So what linear means is that, for example, so I'm going to, okay, this is going to be your concentration, that's going to be your water potential, so W. My god, linear means that concentration is proportional to the water potential. So you could rewrite that as C equals K times W, where K is some sort of constant. What that means is that each time you go up whatever, right, this changes by a set factor as well. So like, for example, a linear relationship between, like, w let's say well, this quantity is 1, this is 2, as this doubles, this also doubles, and so on, right? Th let's say that's C and that's W. This is linear because as this doubles, this also doubles. So that means that C equals KW, and K in this case would be 2. So C equals 2W, because it doubles each time. So that's what the K is. We want to find K in this circumstance by what this changes by, whatever it times is by. So all we do is we just rewrite this as K equals C divided by W, which would be, I don't know, let's try 0 0.04 over minus 1.95. And that gives us 
minus 0 0.0205. So that's our k. So then they're asking us for a water potential of this. So we've been told, so c equals kw. They've told us what w is, and we want to find out what c is. So all you do is you would do c equals minus 0 0.0205 times the w, which is minus 3.41 which gives you 0 0.0699, which is roughly 0 0.7. What linear means is that if you make a change to this, this also changes as well by a set factor each time, and that's what we're working out here. Okay, so in addition to determining the water potential of the leaf cells, they measured the growth of the leaves, and they recorded the leaf growth as a percentage increase of the original leaf area. So the percentile, so remember, percentage increase means the, by how much it's increased by. So a percentage increase of zero means there's no increase, Anything above one means that there is some increase. And obviously if it was negative, then it would be a decrease. But here, you can see on this graph that every, there's a percentage increase all the way until about four, where there is no longer an increase here. So that means there is growth here, there is growth. One leaf with an original area of 60 centimeters squared gave a voltage reading of minus seven microvolts. Use figure eight on page 28 and figure nine to calculate by how much this leaf increased in area and give your answer in centimeters cubed. Okay, so we need to, so we gave a voltage reading of minus seven microvolts. So we're gonna look for minus seven. We're gonna read across to the curve, to the line, sorry. We're gonna read across to the line, and it gives you minus two. So you've got a minus two water potential. So now what we need to do is now correlate it to this graph, which you can see is minus two here, and read it off, which gives a 15% increase. So 15% increase. The original area was 60 centimeters cubed, so a 15% increase would be 60 times 115 over 100, or you could do 60 times 1.15, and that gives you 69 centimeters squared. Nice. To work out a percentage change, all you do is the value times the percentage over 100. If it's a percentage increase, it would be 115% or something like that, you know, that percentage on top of the 100. But if it was a decrease, it would like say it was like a 15% decrease, it'd be 100 minus 15. So that would be 85 over 100. Okay, so sunflowers are not xerophytic plants. The scientist repeats the experiment with xerophytic plants. Suggest and explain one way the leaf growth of xerophytic plants would be different from the leaf growth on sunflowers. On figure nine. Okay, so if you look at figure nine, the percentage growth is lower and lower and lower until you hit about four. A lower water potential eventually leads to no growth. Xerophytes are plants that are able to live in really harsh environments like low water. So what's probably going to happen is that their curve is probably going to look something like this, where they can continue to suffer a bit and continue to grow. So that's what I would say. So growth may continue at lower water potential. Now, why is that? They may be adapted to using less water in, metabo in metabolic reactions. Also, you could probably talk about the other, the other side of it where they have fewer stomatas, so there's lower slow growth. But that's what I would say. They're keeping the conditions the same, so they're still getting the same amount of water given to them, so it has to be something to do with them using the water differently. Use your knowledge of gas exchange in leaves to explain why plants grown in soil with very little water grow so slowly. When you have low water, the stomata close. Now, everyone gets confused about this, so I'm going to explain it real quick. So stomata, there's little pores in plants that are important in plant gas exchange. So they let CO2 in and water because you need those for photosynthesis, right? And that makes glucose. And oxygen is released as a waste product. The problem though with this is that water sometimes leaves as well. And that's a bit of a trade-off, unfortunately. So when they're photosynthesizing, they need the oxygen, but they have to open the stomata and that lets the water escape. However, plants have adaptations for this. They, there's guard cells that surround these and cause them to close. So if a plant is losing too much water or thinks it's gonna to lose too much water, for example, if they're in an environment where there's very low water potential, the stomata closes. If the stomata closes, that means that CO2 can't get in as easily and obviously H2O can't get in as easily. So there is less photosynthesis. If there's less photosynthesis, that means there is less glucose. If there's less glucose, then there's less energy for growth, respiration, blah, 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 you know, all of that stuff. So that's what we need to say. So if, there, if, if there's le very little water, the stomata close, therefore less CO2 uptake, and then less photosynthesis, and less glucose production, okay? Question, that effect of water being lost is called transpiration, where water is lost from the plant. It's a trade-off and plants don't like it. 
The following equation can be used to estimate the metabolic rate of an animal. The metabolic rate equals 63 times the body mass in grams to the power of minus 0.27. Use this equation to calculate how many times faster the metabolic rate of a mouse is than that of a horse. Okay, so for the mouse, it would be 63 times 23 to the minus 0.27, and for the horse, it would be 63 times the mass, which is 550000, to the minus 0.27 is 27.02. And then the other one, 550000, is 1.776. 27.02 over 1.776 equals roughly 15. So it's about 15 times faster. The data in table 7 shows the differences between oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve for a mouse and the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve for a horse. Suggest so how these differences allow the mouse to have a higher metabolic rate than that of the horse. Okay, so I'm presuming from this question your curve is some, looks something like this for the horse, and this looks like this for the mouse. It's a little bit to the right, right? So it says, suggest how these differences allow the mouse to have a higher metabolic rate than the horse. So we just need to look at these curves and compare them, basically. Okay, so the way I remember this is low affinity, right, high affinity, left. Sadly, there's no hack besides that. So the mouse hemoglobin's on the right, so the mouse HB has a lower affinity. And why is that? It's because it wants to give oxygen away more freely. If it has a low affinity, the hemoglobin doesn't bond as strongly to oxygen and readily dissociates it more. That's important because it means that oxygen can more readily be given to respiring tissues. It can be unloaded at higher partial pressures. So that's what it is, is that more O2 unloaded for use in respiring. The bit that people always miss out is they say there's more oxygen unloaded, but they don't explain why that's important. You need to say it's because there's more oxygen available for respiring tissues or else what's the point? Mammals such as a mouse and a horse were able to maintain a constant body temperature using knowledge of surface area to volume ratio to explain the high metabolic rate of that of a mouse and a horse. This question comes up a bajillion times. Mouse, okay, so a mouse has a massive surface area to volume ratio compared to a horse. A horse is much more dense, so therefore they lose heat faster, therefore they respire more to release heat. Do not say produce heat or generate heat, that's what it, it says to reject that, you can't create you can't create heat. To keep a stable internal body temperature, we respire more or less to release more or less heat. That's one of the things we can do. So whenever you get a question about something being like, oh yeah, why does it have such a fast high metabolic rate and, you know, and constant body temperature, this is the kind of thing you want to say. Okay, so now it says explain five properties that make water important for organisms. I'm just going to verbally talk about these because my hand is getting tired from writing. It's first of all a metabolite, so it's used in things like condensation reactions, it's used in photosynthesis, it's used in respiration. Well, it's important in xylems, in the xylem of a plant because of the cohesion. So if you remember the cohesion tension theory, basically what happens is this is the stem, this is the xylem. As water evaporates out, it, it sort of pulls the column of water along with it. So there's another thing, you can say it's got cohesion, so it supports columns of water in plants. You can also say it has a high heat capacity, so it takes a lot of it takes a lot of heat to raise the temperature of water, so that means it can resist changes in temperature. It also has a large latent heat of vaporization. So the difference between those are is the heat capacity, it's how much energy you need to put into something to raise it by one degree. So if you have a high heat capacity, it means you need loads of energy to raise the temperature of something. And the heat latent heat of vaporization means how much energy is required before you evaporate something. It's good that it has a high latent heat of vaporization because when you sweat, it takes a lot of energy to heat up the water to make it evaporate. So it's taking a lot of that heat energy away from you and cooling you. As well as that, you can also say it's a solvent, so it allows the movement of substances as well. So I'll show you what the Mark scheme says. And that is indeed what we've said. Describe the biochemical test you'd use to confirm the presence of a lipid, and then also non-reducing sugar and amylase in a sample. So a lipid... All you do is you add ethanol and water and you shake it and you should see a milky white emulsion. Okay, so when you have a non-reducing sugar, if you add Benedict's solution, it stays blue. It doesn't work because it's not reducing. Benedict's solution only works because a sugar reduces the stuff in it to a solid. That's how it works. So what you do is with a non-reducing sugar, you boil it with hydrochloric acid and then you neutralize it with an alkali and then you heat it with Benedict's solution and then it becomes, you know, red, orange or whatever you want to call it. It has to be boiled. That's because it breaks the reducing it breaks the non-reducing sugar down into reducing sugar. And then last but not least, amylase is a protein. It's an enzyme, so enzymes are proteins. So you add biurets reagent and it should become purple, violet, lilac, or whatever. And if you want bonus points, to test for amylase, you could leave starch, and then you could test for, you know, iodine in it and see it eventually fades up.
And that's what this mark scheme says. With a non-reducing sugar, I often say that you do the Benedict's test first and nothing happens, but then you boil it with acid, neutralize, and then you do it again, but you heat it, and then it does that. Now it says, describe the chemical reactions and the conversions of polymers to monomers and monomers to polymers. Give two examples. If you didn't get full marks on this one, bro, I swear I'll start crying. Because I've always banged on in every single paper tutorial I've ever said, whenever you talk about this kind of stuff, where you're going from monomer to polymer, polymer or whatever, always, always, always say, is it condensation? Is it hydrolysis? What happens with water? So water is released in condensation, water is used in hydrolysis. And then say what the monomer is, glucose and glucose, and then also the bond as well. Is it glycosidic? Is it phosphodiester bonds, ester bonds? If you say that, you will get the mark every single time. And that's what this mark scheme says. I wouldn't lie to you guys. Come on, bro. So here, a condensation reaction joins monomers and releases a molecule of water. Hydrolysis breaks the bond and uses water. And then an example, well, they've listed some examples right here for you. Amino acids and polypeptides, nucleotides and polynucleotides, alpha glucose, beta glucose, all of that stuff in their bonds. So amino acids would be peptide bonds, nucleotides would be phosphodiester bonds, and the glucoses would be glycosidic bonds. If you say that, you will get all of them. In this case, it doesn't talk about triglycerides because they're not polymers in the same way because triglycerides are a monoglycerol attached to three fatty acids, whereas you can keep adding glucose indefinitely forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. 